As loaded down as SDCC was, one of the biggest reveals was that old Hornhead himself, Daredevil, would be appearing in the forthcoming She-Hulk Disney Plus series. So what better time to step back into the Collector series and look at 10 great Daredevil comics that I would recommend for your collection. If your collection needs more Daredevil, but you're not really sure where to start, then this video is for you. Daredevil is coming to the MCU and the return of Charlie Cox to the role has a lot of people very excited. Throw in what appears to be a nod to Daredevil's original red and yellow costume and there may be as much excitement for the man without fear as there is for the show's title character. Before we get to the books, if you've been enjoying the content lately, do me a favor and hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, or share the video out to your friends if you haven't already. I appreciate it. Let's take a look at the first book. In the early 1980s, a talented young artist and writer named Frank Miller would pull Daredevil's feet out of the fire. The up and coming creator would turn the title around from being one of the worst performing in the Marvel line to being one of the hottest titles Marvel had. But that's not where the story starts. Miller and Daredevil first crossed paths in our number 10 book, Spectacular Spider-Man number 27. Published in February 1979, Spec Spider 27 repaid the favor that Daredevil had given Spider-Man all the way back in Daredevil 16, when now legendary Spider-Man artist John Romita Sr. drew Spidey for the very first time. Here it was Miller who would draw Daredevil for the first time in a Spider-Man book. Within three months, Miller would be given the art duties for Daredevil beginning with issue 158, and that run would go through issue 191, which was released in February 1983. Spectacular Spider-Man 27 has been popular with collectors for some time now, but be sure to look it over if you find a copy. Whitman made a reprint of Spectacular Spider-Man 27, which can be identified by a blank UPC box. There is also the Marvel Value Pack or JCPenney reprint, which can be identified by the presence of early 90s advertisements. But it's not all bad news as there's also a Mark Jewelers variant floating around out there. This book will currently set you back between 80 and $100 for a nice high grade raw copy. One of the easiest ways to fill the interior of a Silver Age comic was to have two of your heroes run afoul of each other. Typically, the winner would be determined by whose name was on the cover of the book, or the fight would just end in a draw. A classic Silver Age cover, and one of the more notable Silver Age Daredevil covers, our number 9 book, Daredevil 43, is dripping with Kirby goodness. The Kirby cover has been homaged on more than one occasion over the years, but the hits keep coming with this issue as the interior art is handled by Gene Colan and the story is from none other than Stan the Man Lee. Published back in August 1968, just because this book hails from the Silver Age doesn't mean it's going to blow out your budget. You can actually bring home a pretty nice copy around the VF range for a little under $100 as of right now. That's not too shabby. Our next book cuts deep. Frank Miller giveth and Frank Miller taketh away. Coming in in the number eight spot is Daredevil 181. The climax of Miller's fabled Daredevil run, this issue sees the final showdown between Bullseye and Elektra. Unfortunately for Elektra, she winds up on the wrong end of one of her own size in a panel that kind of still makes me squirm in my chair every time I see it. Despite this being a memorable death, don't forget that this is comics, so naturally she was back to life within nine months. Published in April 1982, the creative team for this issue is all Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen. On a sadder note, the issue was actually dedicated to early Daredevil artist and EC Comics legend Wallace Wally Wood, who had passed away just earlier in November 1981 as production for this issue was underway. This double-sized issue has a massive print run, which has helped keep prices affordable you can readily find this issue for 50 to 60 bucks for a pretty nice raw copy. In 1998, Marvel did something that had never been done before. They ended all of their legacy titles and launched volume two for all of their long running series with brand new number ones. Our number seven book, Daredevil number one, was one of those books known by a couple of different names. There's Daredevil Volume 2, Number 1, Marvel Knights Daredevil Number 1, or I've even heard it referred to as Kevin Smith's Daredevil Number 1, a nod to the issue's famous scribe who made his Daredevil debut in this issue. 
paired with Joe Quesada on pencils and Jimmy Palmiotti on the inks, this new beginning for Daredevil started out pretty strong. As I mentioned, this book was published in November 1998, and Daredevil Volume 2 is a very collectible run, and it has a number of great story arcs from such modern comic book wizards as the aforementioned Kevin Smith, Brian Michael Bendis, Ed Brubaker, and Andy Diggle. Like most Volume 2 number ones, Daredevil 1 is still fairly inexpensive, coming in at just $10 for a raw high-grade copy. May 1988 was a great month for new Marvel villains. Venom, one of the biggest and best Spider-Man villains introduced since the Silver Age, debuted an Amazing Spider-Man number 300. But in our number six book, Daredevil 254, Typhoid Mary made her debut. A mutant with the powers of pyrokinesis, telekinesis, and telepathy, Typhoid Mary is quite skilled with bladed weapons and is also a talented martial artist. One of the Kingpin's favorite henchmen at the time, Typhoid Mary would be a regular nemesis for Daredevil. Art duties for Daredevil 254 were handled by John Romita Jr. as far as the pencils go, and the legendary Al Williams took on the inks. The story, titled Typhoid, was written by Anne Nocenti. This book honestly hates me. Routinely, I find it missing from Daredevil runs I pick up. I'm generally more surprised when I actually find a copy of it than when it's been picked out before I get my hands on a collection. Despite my issues picking up this issue, I still like it a lot. I think Typhoid Mary is ripe for adaptation in the MCU once Daredevil's Disney Plus show gets up and running. Currently selling for around $25 for a raw high-grade copy, Daredevil 254 is one of the most valuable issues of the last half of Daredevil Volume 1's 380 issues. Every superhero needs a villainous organization to go up against. The X-Men have the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Batman has the League of Assassins. Spider-Man has the Sinister Six. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have the foot, and Daredevil has the hand. Our number five book is Daredevil 174, where the hand make their debut. Who are the hand, you might be asking? They are a ninja clan and something of a religious cult that worships a demon called the Beast. They're also kind of into things like resurrecting dead assassins, and believe it or not, eventually Daredevil would even lead the group briefly around and during the Shadowland event. Another entry from the Miller Daredevil run, it's hard to really overemphasize how important the contributions of Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen were to Daredevil. Published in September 1981, Daredevil 174 is also just the third appearance of Elektra, which is pretty fitting considering how closely her character has been tied to the hand over the years. In a story titled The Assassination of Matt Murdock, the Kingpin wants Daredevil dead, and he calls on the hand to do the deed. A collectible issue that won't break the bank. You should be able to pick up a nice copy of this book for between $25 and $30 in the current market. One of the best things about putting together a Daredevil collection is that a good amount of the Silver Age issues are not particularly expensive. Outside of the major keys, most issues can be found in really nice shape for under $100. Bucks. Our number four book is a great example of this. Coming in at the number four spot is Daredevil 57. Published in October 1969, Daredevil 57's key moment would go on to have a massive impact in Daredevil's story and ties directly back into our number one book. In this issue, Daredevil reveals his identity to Karen Page. You know, what can go wrong, right? She's a trustworthy supporting character and a longtime love interest of Matt Murdock. Unfortunately, due to falling on hard times, things go sideways, but you know, we'll talk about that in a bit. The cover art was a team effort with the majority of the work being done by Gene Colan. However, John Romita Sr. contributed a small alteration to Matt Murdock's face. Inside the book, Colan handles the pencils while Roy Thomas scripted the issue's tale. A book whose price tag doesn't reflect its significance? You can pick up a pretty nice copy of Daredevil 57 for 50 or 60 bucks right now. Imagine having your own comic series and having 169 issues under your belt before the villain who would become known as your arch nemesis even makes an appearance in your title. Not only that, this character's been around for 
you know, he's basically 14 years old by the time they showed up. This is exactly what happened to Daredevil. And in the number three spot, we're shining the light on Daredevil 170, where the Kingpin appears in Daredevil for the first time. Despite his late entrance, it's not until the following issue where Daredevil and the Kingpin actually meet face to face for the first time. But as we know, Kingpin first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man 50 back in July 1967 and was known as a Spider-Man villain at the time. But under the guidance of Frank Miller, Wilson Fisk would become one of only a few Marvel villains that is so closely associated with more than one superhero. Published in May 1981, this issue is brought to you by, you guessed it, Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen. Currently bringing between $30 and $40 for raw, high-grade copies, this issue is a pivotal moment for Old Hornhead. Okay. I'm bending the rules a little bit on this one. This is a book you've heard me talk about before, and honestly, it's kind of a bit pricey for inclusion in a collector series video, but no Daredevil fan should ever be without our number two book, Daredevil number seven. Let's take a trip in the way, way back machine, and our journey is gonna stop in April 1965 when this issue was published. So why is this issue a must have? It's got a couple things going for it. First and foremost, this is the first appearance of Daredevil's classic red costume. The character's design had slowly changed since his first appearance, most notably in issue five, where the single large D logo that he'd had on his costume for the first several issues was replaced with the double D logo that we're all familiar with today. Now, in Daredevil 7, the classic Daredevil look was in place, and we have Wally Wood to thank for that. On top of the new costume, Wood also provides a classic Silver Age cover depicting Daredevil and Namor squaring off underwater. Namor covers and appearances are starting to catch fire now that the character has been confirmed for Wakanda Forever. Woody provided the cover and the interior art, while this guy named Stan Lee contributed the story for this issue, which would also serve as the springboard for Namor replacing Giant Man as the co-feature in Tales to Astonish alongside the Incredible Hulk, beginning in Tales to Astonish issue 70. A high-grade raw copy of this book is gonna cost you a couple grand, but here in the Collector's series, we don't have to have a perfect one. We're gonna be more interested in a lower-grade copy that can be picked up for just a couple hundred bucks. Topping the list of the Daredevil Collector series top 10 is my all-time favorite Daredevil book, Daredevil 227. For my money, there is simply no better Daredevil story than the one that kicks off in this issue. Frank Miller is back with a brand new story arc titled Born Again, and this time he brought a friend with him, David Mazzuchelli. Mazzuchelli would handle the cover and interior art duties for this entire story, which would run through Daredevil 233. Despite the great story within, I've always loved Mazzuchelli's cover to Daredevil 227, with the New York City skyline in the background and Daredevil in the foreground in the sights of the Kingpin, who is basically looming over the other elements of the cover. As I alluded to earlier, Karen Page knowing Daredevil's secret identity kind of went off the rails at the beginning of this issue, which was published in February 1986. Additionally, this book has seen a massive jump in value following the announcement that the upcoming Disney Plus Daredevil show will use Born Again as a subtitle. Prior to that announcement, you could pick up copies of this book for just five to 10 bucks, pretty much all day, every day. Well now, just a few weeks later, high grade copies of this book are bringing upwards of $40 for raw copies. I guess the fact that I've been buying every copy of this thing that I've come across for about five years now is probably about to pay off. Oh, and if you've already checked this story out and you enjoyed the Miller and Mazzuchelli team up, they would wrap up Born Again and jump over to DC and the Batman title where they would tell an equally fantastic tale for the Dark Knight, Year One. Daredevil has seen a big bump in interest since the character first hit the streaming platforms in Netflix Daredevil series. A dark, gritty, and violent approach to the character, people could finally put that underwhelming Ben Affleck movie behind them despite how great of a soundtrack it had and that whole Coolio subplot that was relegated to the director's edition. Following the announcement of an 18 episode Disney Plus season at SDCC last month, the anticipation of seeing Daredevil in the MCU is really starting to boil over. 
especially after we got that sneak peek of Charlie Cox in the MCU and No Way Home. And then there was that little reveal at the end of the SDCC She-Hulk trailer on top of that. Happy hunting out there and don't forget to collect responsibly. I'll see you in the next video.